So I have a conflict of interest that I have to announce. Um, I've actually been asked to be a consultant to the Prime Minister of India, who is looking for a new Minister of Health, and it's been brought to his attention that there's a big problem in TB, and you know we're talking about uh, not just tuberculosis, where there's a huge number of cases, but about 650,000 cases of MDR-TB, 150,000 deaths, um, and um, he's asked me to report to him on you know, what they've done wrong and how we're going to fix it, and you've heard some thoughts here about that, but you think you're here on a panel for students. No, you're each being interviewed to be Minister of Health <laughs> of the Government of India, and <laughs> I am providing the best advice to the Prime Minister. So I will ask you to uh, comment. Um, these numbers are really staggering from my point of view. When you hear that only 42,000 uh, treatments for MDR-TB are being given anywhere in the world, uh, we're talking about 6% of all, 6.5% of all uh, MDR cases get any treatment at all, let alone TDR. Um, my first question, I'm trying to figure out how we're going to do India better, is how did we get here? What did we do wrong that got us to where we are here? <laughs> <laughs> Rob, why don't you start? Well, I think that what I said in my presentation this morning, or this afternoon, is really that we've treated people without really knowing what we're treating. I think that that is the fundamental error, and it's not my uh, thoughts. I think those are the thoughts that came as early as the 50s, that we need really to do DST, I would have thought, upfront, whether it's affordable or not. Is it, is it, can we uh, avoid doing it? I don't think so anymore. I think that there must be sufficient funds somewhere in the world. Um, and I think that's the only way we're going to prevent am amplification and limit transmission. I think that it, it's more than just DST. Uh, I think that there's a, a whole programmatic change as well, and Karin Jacobson's got some nice data on a poster outside. It's, it's also about getting the clinics to react to the data that comes in. So I think that would be a good starting point. Maybe somebody else. Who else wants to venture on how we got here? So that we can learn how either not to get that to happen. For example, 75% of TB cases or more in the United States are immigrant imported cases. Simple solution, close your borders. Is anybody suggesting we do that? So the question really is, um, how did we get here worldwide? Uh, Rob answered a systems question. You know, It's a multifaceted thing. What are the things got us here? Kishi. I'll take one, but then again, I'm going to be biased because I'm a drugs person. But my, in my presentation, the very first thing I pointed out is that we need more drugs. So we have, we have more choices. So when uh, Dr. Udwadia at the end says, you can treat, and then when you move on, what do you do next? If, if people don't respond to the first regimen, what do you do next? I don't, know, I don't know that anybody has a good answer right now if you don't have a new reg, full regimen that can actually take care of that business. But I, can I just also add one thing, and I, it's something that I don't know much about, but I've seen it. I've seen in situations, and I, I'd like Dr. Udwaria to uh, respond to this maybe. I've seen situations where you see a presentation from uh, Doctors Without Borders, and they can have patients sitting in a hospital being observed, being treated, and some of them still fail and that they're compliant and all that. And that, to me, again, says we need more drugs, but it also says TB is hard. And, and I, I, I think we just... Okay, but you're, you're not good candidates to be minister of health. <laughs> so let me imagine what I hear from my minister of health. I mean, you guys are focused on one disease. You know, 100,000, 150,000 people die. We have AIDS, we have TB, we have heart disease, we have mental health, we have hepatitis B and C, we have pneumococcal vaccine that doesn't get out there for kids, we have moms dying in uh, childbirth, 
And you want to tell me that this is a high priority, that you're going to make this as Minister of Health? How do you decide what your priority is? Dr. Udwadi must have a thought on that. The Ministry of Health wouldn't believe a word of what I said anyway. <laughs> <laughs> ah, but you may replace him after today, yes. <laughs> But, but really, I think the, the, the seeds were laid, so to speak, in the original uh, uh, national TB control program uh, before DOTS really stepped in, because that was a disaster. It was an inefficient way of treating patients. Uh, it was completely unsupervised and chaotic. And maybe that's when the seeds were first laid. Then there's this question of completely unregulated private sector. And uh, the point that I made about 70% of people choosing to go private in the first place, as far as TB goes, no matter how impoverished they are. So even the poor farmer in rural Uttar Pradesh, uh, with very little money in his pocket, if he has the means, will try and go uh, private as opposed to public. Telling you what a poor perception people have of the public program, I guess, to start with. Uh, but something as simple as legislation to say, look, private practitioners who have meet a certain qualification uh, only can prescribe second-line drugs. Something as simple as that would, with one sweep, perhaps, uh, uh, reduce the amount of uh, poor prescriptions and, in a sense, reduce the amplification of uh, tuberculosis. No, no, I, quite, I quite agree, and I think it isn't just 70% for TB drugs. Yes. In India, it's 77% of all healthcare is private. Sure. And that leads to the dilemma as candidates for Minister of Health. The public system is lousy. It treats people um, like cattle. People don't want to go there. They wait for hours. They get infected with whatever is going on there. And the solution has been the private sector, where um, you can get saline IVs injections and feel like somebody's treated you. You can get a steroid shot to make you feel really good for about 48 hours, and you feel good. How do you support the public system um, without being attacked and done in by the private system? I think it just has to be more regulated. And I guess, again, that brings us back to legislation. And uh, it can be borne upon, really, to at least say TB prescriptions, if nothing else, are prescribed by so-called TB experts. Sadly, back home again, everyone is a TB expert because everyone treats tuberculosis. So legislation. So can I ask, um, so can I ask a question? Yes, in regard to, So do you think it's possible to come up with a solution to creatively engage the private sector, to engage and train the private sector such that you don't create a public-private schism, but in fact mobilize the private sector and maybe mobilize the private sector to do some things that the pu public sector does not do sure, well? Sure, sure. A, a colleague called Mukundu Plekar, who some of you might know at WHO Geneva, has spent uh, most of his life just trying to set up such models. There are a few in place, uh, but they are few and far between, really. Uh, the private practitioner feels the minute the patient goes to a government hospital, he loses control, i.e. dollars. So it's difficult to, to get the right balance, really. But there are a few uh, uh, projects which really show that uh, you can get that way. And do you, do you see models by which those, pro uh, those seed projects that have worked well could be scaled up? Absolutely. Maybe the, 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 the patient being diagnosed in the private sector, a hospital like ours, which has the facilities to do so, sent back to the public sector for their actual treatment under supervision, coming back to us at the end of treatment for us to verify that they're OK and cured. But uh, on a countrywide scale in a country of 1.2 billion, it's, 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 a, it's a hard one. So it's the, it's, it's, the, it's the least thankful job, the health minister of India, I guess. <laughs> it's uh, not, not the greatest job in the cabinet. <laughs> Uh, let me just say on the on the the issue of public private partnerships. There, as uh, an advisor to the prime minister, I have to give many many kudos. Probably has the most sophisticated public private partnerships. One example is something called Operation Asha, which is uh, a TB treatment program in the slums of uh, Delhi and now seven other cities, in places where the public sector workers can't go. They go, no one pays any attention to them, they get beat up or hassled. So there is no treatment for those slums. And so they have taken local people, just like Partners in Health has done in Haiti and every other country, trained them to provide dots. The public sector does the tests for traditional TB. I don't think they do DSTs for the moment. Um, and then the local people, and they provide the drugs, and the local people, cure rates are 94% and document it. So engaging the private sector would be one fairly creative 
solution, but there are lots of private sectors. I, I will just share with you, I, I went, I flew in the 1980s. I had a, a I, I started my career in international health uh, by being in India on a, on a leprosy mission and then teaching the first course in immunology. And I saw rifampicin being sold in shops. Hmm. So I, one of my colleagues, husband was the chief medical officer of the governor of India. And I got an interview with him. His name was Mr. Shriniva, Dr. Srinivasan. It was the most bizarre experience. I flew from America, flew in at 3 o'clock in the morning, took a shower, went to his office, brought all the books on how uh, Stieblo had treated 100 counties, the whole country of Tanzania, with supervised treatment, said India could do that, and they should restrict the use of rifampicin. This is 1980s. And I'm not a bad talker. But Mr. Shridi, Dr. Srinivasan kept looking at the clock the entire time of my meeting with him. And at noon, he thanked me for my visit. He took none of my books. He went and left. And when I opened the paper the next day, Rajiv Gandhi's cabinet dissolved, and the Minister of Health disappeared. So timing is everything. <laughs> but this uh, is, is not a new message uh, for India um, by any means. Another factoid is when we put out combined treatment for leprosy, when I chaired a committee at WHO, there were 36 drug combinations being used to treat leprosy, and there must have been 70 for TB. And there was no regulation of any regimen. Any physician or quack could provide whatever drugs that they wanted. So there's a, a big systemic problem. I'm going to ask Kishi, how do we get new drugs? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not that people are asleep in the laboratories around Harvard, <laughs> even in the middle of the night. Right. Be before I get there, let me just say something I want you to say in response to your question of why our disease over everybody else's. Good. Well, for, for starters, we are the only disease that doesn't discriminate, actually discriminate only in the sense that it's embed embedded mostly in the poor people, but really anybody that breeds can get it, and that's a good reason that it should, all, it should be all hands on deck. The second reason is that we know that drugs work because we know that drugs work in diseases that people are focused on very strongly, particularly they think they can ma make money on it. Look at how HIV caught up with us and passed us right along because the money was there and the effort was there and you could diagnose and you could treat and you, you, you had, uh, you had um, um, biomarkers. We, we don't have any of those in TB and that's, that's part of the difficulty. But I want to go back to the chart that I showed earlier. At some point after 1960, we just stopped doing anything for TB and we lost that time. How do we get new drugs? Money, money, money. Because I. I think it's hard. So we, we, we have some groups that are stopping because they're unsuccessful in, in TB drug discovery. But I think instead of stopping, we should try even harder. The talks that I saw this morning, some of them were very, very promising to me. We just need, we need a concerted effort in understanding the disease very, very well, and then understanding how to kill the bug, and then understanding the disease in relation to the, the bug in relation to the disease, and then bring all the knowledge that we know both from drug discovery, but also on immunomodulation, and actually do something different for a change. Bob, how would you do it? I think that you have to use a, a multifaceted approach. I, it, there's no question that we need more drugs, and actually there are drugs in the pipeline. There's actually quite a few drugs that are coming in. One of the challenges is how do we decide which drugs to put into regimens, and you talked about that in your talk. Um, I think we actually need more than one regimen. There may be, uh, 10 years from now, a great regimen that is good for everything, but not all patients are going to be able to tolerate that regimen. They, they'll just have idiosyncratic reactions. So we need to have more than one regimen that works. So part of the picture is developing enough new drugs so that we have excess capacity so that we can deal with all the patients who are out there. Um, the other side of it, though, and I think Dr. Podolsky's talk showed us that it's very difficult to ensure proper drug use by regulation. 
It doesn't mean we shouldn't try. In fact, it's very important to try. It's very important to get the message out there that misuse of drugs leads to their loss and we can slow down the loss. I don't think we're ever going to make it impossible for drugs to, for emergence of resistance to drugs because of improper use, but we can reduce the, uh, the speed at which it happens and I think that's an important part of it. I mean, basically we're dealing with human nature here. Doctors have a desire to give their drug, drugs to their patients and private sector doctors in India who are treating TB don't want their patients to die, but they may not have the right drugs or they may not have the right knowledge to give the right drugs in the right way, so the result is not good. So we need to have education and regulation about drugs. We need to help private sector physicians do a better job, and at the same time, we need to have more drugs available so there are options because it's not going to be one size fits all. So it's all our fault in the sense that we have given bad drugs, we have given them in the bad proportion. What about the 25 to 30 percent default rate of patients who don't take our drugs? How do we deal with that problem? I, I, I personally don't think we can put the blame on the patient. It, it's part of the medical system's job to make sure that the disease gets treated, and the patient who has the disease is part of the picture. But I don't think that, I mean, I think in a sense, we as physicians are responsible for letting the patients default from treatment. I mean, one of the things that's amazing to me is that we have had the tools to cure TB for 40 years, and yet the disease keeps growing. Why is that? It's because we haven't put the tools to use. We haven't had the political will to get out there and do it. In the HIV world, they realized that they were not doing a job they should have been doing, and they've gotten together and raised awareness and started to roll out treatment. We need to do the same thing. We, it, we have these tools, and why hasn't the job been yeah, done? But, but the gentleman in the last slide is not the same as an AIDS activist who is going to go run to his government uh, in a state of cachexia and mobilize uh, a defined, very active, politically active community. Uh, it's a different case, I think, than, than HIV in terms of mobilization. You have to mobilize for TB healthy people uh, to protect those that are really suffering uh, from TB, and that's quite, uh, quite a challenge. Scott, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I, I, mean, I think that was beautifully said, and I think historically uh, there are these instances of politicization, of mobilization, and, 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 and the, the marginalized populations have always gotten the shortest end of the stick, and it, it, been, this disease has been ignored in that setting. That figure of 1.5 percent, I don't know what the magic number is for GDP devoted to health, but 1.5 percent certainly sounds inadequate compared to other sectors of the economy. And so it shouldn't be conceived of as, as a zero-sum game of coronary artery disease versus TB versus HIV. These are all important health issues. Um, and so it is going to require some type of this, this politicization is going to have to happen around TB the way it has happened to some degree around HIV, to some, way, some degree it's happened around antibiotic resistance since the people here, actually, who are going to be responsible for uh, elevating its, 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 its vis visibility. And actually, I would like, I was wondering if I could ask Dr. Udwadi about whether or not the poor in India actually have political power associated with their, their socioeconomic status in a different way than they would in the United States, and whether or not there is a possibility of kind of popular uprising and popular politi political pressure. Sadly, not this kind of poor. And uh, visiting South Africa, I've been so impressed at the activism that uh, it's so much a part of HIV and now also of TB. But uh, these are really, uh, 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 really the, the lowest in the totem pole and uh, have no voice uh, of their own, really. One thing we do have going for us with TB is that it's an equal opportunity disease. And uh, I've done some community engagement work around TB, and we've been most successful when we can convince the, the, the top tier of the community, the upper class, the people with money and power, that in fact they're at risk for TB too, because they are at risk. And, and that's something that isn't appreciated, because at least since, since my, my parents' generation, in my parents' generation, everybody knew everybody was at risk for TB. In the last 50 years, it has become a disease that's more of the lower classes. But in fact, 
it's spread to anyone. And in fact, we have, it's not uncommon to have cases where uh, someone who is working in the household from the lower class gives it to the household. And these uh, cases actually, when word gets out, uh, they, they scare the people with power and you get action. I, I think the Times of India uh, picked up on that and I think there, there are opportunities there that we need to, to use to make people realize that uh, TB is an equal opportunity disease. Everyone is at risk. Rob, how do you mobilize uh, the activities in a country like South Africa um, in a way that they are acutely aware it's in the newspapers about XDR TB and the time to death of the people in KwaZulu Natal right. of 16 days from diagnosis to death? Uh, it has scared the people. Has it politically mobilized um, resources? Are there personnel to use the resources? I think that we don't have, or haven't had a massive response. The, the response really was to, to stop nosocomial transmission in South Africa. That was the main priority, um, because it was a nosocomial outbreak. Um, and it was to, um, I think, also declare that there was a, a bigger problem and to try to make more beds available. But those beds are totally inadequate. I think that we're only treating around 40% of all diagnosed MDR cases in South Africa at the moment. The rest, I'm not sure what actually happens to them, to be honest. I don't think there's a strong enough voice, uh, personally. I think that there is some level of mobilization, but it is not strong enough. It's not anywhere close to to the HIV voice, and uh, I would have thought that the HIV voice would have taken in the TB voice. It's uh, beginning. A, yeah, and, and to try to um, mobilize and support patients a lot more. I think that there's, there are pockets where it's happening, but in the vast majority of cases there is a lack of support. There isn't a, a situation where uh, the community is looking after the ill, I think. That would be a way of... Um, ensuring adherence and, and taking uh, more of a responsibility from the uh, public sector in terms of having a, a DOTS strategy that, that's going to work. I think that if patients have to go to a clinic every day to take their tablets and they've got to weigh that up in terms of earning a salary, the salary, or, which is going to be a very small stipend, often um, overwhelms their um, health. They would rather compromise health to be able to earn a salary, and that obviously happens in the very poor. Dr. Edwari? Your, your point about supervision was really crucial, but it's so much more difficult supervising someone who has MDR and XDR, and where, Absolutely. You, where, the, where the period of supervision runs into two years with injections. And I think that was the strength of uh, Paul Farmer's work, that uh, the workers actually went to each village and gave each dose under supervision. And uh, that's, I'm sure, partly the reason why the results were, were, were so outstanding as well in those days. Dr. Dwali also mentioned the, the stigma of TB, and that, that is a big issue. Uh, people are afraid to admit that they have TB. And Often the reason is they think it can't be cured. They think it's a fatal disease and they're going to die from it and they don't want anyone to know. And if they have MDR-TB, they may be right. I think there may be an opportunity here as we do develop new regimens that are more successful against MDR-TB and can, in fact, achieve reasonable cure rates. We should be going out to try to make it clear that something new has happened, that it's changed, that you don't need to hide your TB because we can cure it. And this may actually give us a way to, to begin to, get, get to, to fight the stigma issue uh, and, and get the message out that we have. So I mean, it's something psychological about new drugs and new regimens. Even if it was the old regimen, the problem we have is the old regimen, it, has, it can cure TB, and yet if it's, people look at you and they say, well, it's been around for 40 years and we got a lot of TB, so it isn't working, even though it could be working. So let me just hit you up and Kissy and the panel on. So we have new drugs, OK? And we have failed regimens. And we have patients with MDR and XDR and TDR TB. How do you protect the new drugs? 
we heard the prices. You can cure a TB patient for like $15 for a full course of regular TB. And in India, it's about $4,000 for an MDR case, let alone you know, with the fancy new drug. How would you protect those drugs? Would you allow compassionate use when the doctor says, my job is to save every patient, give me the new drug? Are you going to say as Minister of Health, no, you can't have it unless we have two drugs or three drugs to protect you know, TMC or PA or whatever. What's your position on that? Yeah, actually, um, we convened, a, I, I'm the head of a group called Resist TB, and we actually convened a group and have written a position paper about this question. It is a very dicey question, but uh, it, you have to respond to it. There clearly are patients who need compassionate use for these drugs, and to the extent that um, we can get these drugs to them, we should do so. And the reality of it, sadly, is that uh, it's very, very difficult to get these drugs to the patients who need them, let alone with appropriate companion drugs, which is the only way we want to do it. Um, and the reasons are mostly bureaucratic. Countries, the countries where the patients exist who need these drugs do not have mechanisms by which you can have compassionate use. So Tebotec has had a compassionate use program. It's been open for a year, and 50 patients have received these drugs, and 25 of those patients were in Europe which is not the hotbed of MDR-TB. So it's not MDR-TB. The patients really, we're looking at XDR-TB patients, but they're not getting there because there's no mechanism to get the drugs there. So in a sense, that may work in our favor, but clearly they need to be given out with companion drugs. There are some companion drugs out there, like linazolid and such, which are very difficult to work with, but which patients will probably not be resistant to. So it's possible, but it's actually been very difficult to do. Right. I think we can't wait for a new regime, but uh, I think the model used in the TMC study and the Otsuka drugs, the Dilaminid study was uh, the right way to go, really. They added on the drug or placebo to a background optimal regime, and at least in the short periods that they used it, uh, they showed uh, good, good conversion yeah. rates. And uh, So maybe that's the way to go while we're waiting for a whole new regime, which, which might be a decade away. Right. Kissy? Yeah, so <laughs> that's a difficult one for us at the TB Alliance, because our stand, as I sort of uh, showed earlier, is we would like to get the new regimens composed mostly of things that are not compromised by resistance and get them out there as a unit so that they protect each other and they're all effective at the same time. But uh, obviously, everybody's aware of this in this room, the groups that are testing these compounds in clinical trials right now are pharmaceutical companies that are, are particular about speed and they're particular about the uh, easier path. And the easier path right now was to go to the MDR and sh where you can show that difference very, very easy with the new agent. And it's the right thing to do for them. We just don't think it's the best thing to do for the disease. So what we are trying to do is play catch up with that and rush with our regimen so that we can catch those things before they are too compromised and get them in combinations that we, we believe are effective. You asked earlier, what do we do with the new regimens and what do we do to, make, to, to, uh, to, um, to encourage co compliance? We strongly believe, one dimensional about this, and maybe we're wrong, but we strongly believe that six months is always gonna be worse for anybody to take any drugs, any regimen, then, then one month or one week or one day will be. So the shorter the, uh, the duration of treatment will be better for everybody. But we just are not there yet. But the sooner we get there, the better. So new drugs, better combination, all new and uncompromised by resistance, simpler treatments for a shorter time, I think is what is hopefully going to get us there. So let's work hard on those new drugs in case I haven't said that enough. Okay. Uh, quick line, and then we're going to turn to the audience for questions. Sure. Just to say that the Global Alliance has led the way in in, in, in moving us towards testing regimens rather than single drugs. And the public sector is stepping in. Uh, there are too many different possible combinations for the Global Alliance to be able to test them all. The AIDS Clinical Trials Unit now also has a study underway in which they are studying different combinations of several new drugs at once. And it's going to be necessary for the public sector to step up because the profit motive is not there. Right. Sorry, I forgot just one thing that Dr. Odwadia mentioned, and it's one of the things that we're sort of trying to spearhead at the TV Alliance, where we're going to try and apply so that we can get these organizations with the new 
medicines to go and actually try some clinical trials in specific centers of excellence, clinical trial centers, where we can target just those completely comp compromised uh, populations like the XDRs and the TDRs, just do that really as fast as possible to, to catch up again with the drugs that are getting out there and try and do Okay. Uh, questions from the audience, please. Yes. Well, Barry, I wanted to make a comment going back to your original question. What should the Minister of Health say to the Prime Minister? Right. Um, and, and it seems to me that much of the discussion has been about what should the Minister of Health within India talk about India, but really uh, how should the Minister of Health advise the Prime Minister to make the case globally that TB is a global disease and that the dichotomy between first world and what is known in the first world and what is possible in the first world and the third world has to be overcome. It's the, it's the maldistribution of wealth, uh, but both wealth in terms of real dollars, but wealth in terms of knowledge that has to be overcome. And that seems to me the, prime, the Minister of Health's primary goal. Uh, the Prime Minister could do that, but you'll note in this country, until somebody flew back on an airplane with alleged MDRTB, there was no interest in the United States of America's public in TB, and it turns out right. when it was all over, CDC didn't do very good DSTs, right. and he didn't have a DRTB, <laughs> uh, but he spent some time in Colorado. Good question. Other questions, please. Yeah, yeah, or, uh, no, yes, here. Uh, wherever who has a yeah, mic. Yes. yes. Back, you know, back. You, we've been talking about drugs all the time, and if you bring a new drug, they'll be resistant. Me as a clinician, I do blood test, uh, TB skin test on students. Students that are positive, nature does a fantastic job. 90, all the students I see when I do chest x-ray, they're always normal. What can we do to, to improve nature? Nature does a fantastic job. 95% are latent. What can we do to improve that to 100%? And what should we do when we see a patient, you know, a student has strongly positive TB skin test and they're doing INH for six months, should we tell them to take cod liver oil, vitamin D, vitamin A? Should we try to improve their nutrition? <laughs> you know, antibiotic is not the answer. The anti you know, what we have to help nature, do you think the role of macrophage? Last month, you know, in Nature, Harvard University published a very, very good paper showing the effect of fish oil on, you know, when you give fish oil to patients, or to, they were doing an animal on a mice, they needed much less antibiotic. Most of them survived with very large dose of bacteria. Do you think fish oil is important to, to have healthy macrophage to control disease? So if I could take that question and put it back to the panel as you raised it, but the more general question. Lancet ran a meeting about a decade ago in Washington, first meeting run in this country by the new editor of the Lancet, and it was on tuberculosis. And someone got up at the meeting and said, it's crazy to run a meeting on tuberculosis because tuberculosis is a disease of poverty, and until you wipe out poverty, you're not going to deal with tuberculosis. You've mentioned India has the largest number of undernourished kids in the world, also suffering from poverty. Um, do we have to cure poverty to get rid of TB? Uh, can we get rid of undernutrition and increase resistance? Are they strategies that would work at an India level? Even as a simple clinician, I can't uh, fail but notice the importance of nutrition in each patient uh, of TBIC. The first thing I clock when they come in is how much they've gained in terms of weight between visits. And if they've gained, gained even half a kilo or a pound, uh, I'll know they're on a winning track. Uh, while they, the, the ones who are not going to make it uh, 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 just will not gain or, or will keep going down. So it is uh, a, a very good question, uh, really, and a good point. You need to manipulate their immune systems. Vitamin D, of course, is uh, always uh, in and out of fashion and may have a role. Uh, but uh, 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 someone wise said, uh, really, what you need to cure TB in India is give them all enough food. And uh, he had a point. And this is, many of these are old notions. I mean, Thomas McKeown, 50 years ago, was showing graphs of using demographic data to show the decline of TB in, in, in England and Wales from the 17th, 18th century through today. And most of that reduction was well before streptomycin, I mean, 
was before sanatoria. This is all in the setting of increased nutrition in England and Wales. But it does seem that the, um, if you pose it as a question of curing poverty, you almost create a defeat, a, you know, defeat before you start. And similarly, if it's an intervention as simple as vitamin D, and I don't know if the Global Alliance has considered that, as you <laughs> often say, I have, yes. you have often say, there are, because there are no economic benefits, even minor economic benefits associated with vitamin D, if effectively those trials never happen on a large enough Nobody's scale. Nobody's going to pay $100 million for a half a cent a day intervention. Right, and, there, and consequently, trials, it's either yeah. too large a problem or too, or too small, small an intervention. Right, and for the drug producers, I think Kissy didn't say, this is too small a problem. To design a drug for this small number of people uh, is not worth their time, and that's a fundamental problem. Uh, yeah, I, I have a short comment about the Prime Minister and, and a question. Oh, good. Uh, so uh, the Prime Minister doesn't have tenure, so he needs to keep his job. And a simple way uh, of doing that uh, is to realize that TB is enormously damaging to India's economy. I think it is not difficult to measure how much money India loses because of lost uh, investment and tourism because of the bad publicity that our good doctor created uh, 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 with this problem. And I think that the, that economic damage will be considerably more than what India annually spends on TB. Uh, so that may be not a bad argument to present. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but I'm not an, an economist, so I have a, a question about, uh, about TB for the panel. Uh, so, I realize that we probably do not have a definitive answer as to why actually TB acquires multidrug resistance and why it is uniquely different from other bacteria like H. pylori or E. coli who actually do not do that. Uh, and, and I wonder uh, whether that is a result of the effect of very high uh, population size. Uh, which in turn is a, probably a result of, uh, of a die-hard mechanism that TB has, the nature of which we do not know. I do not know why it is so difficult to kill TB. It has actually nothing to do with its slow growth, that I do know. So maybe someone uh, on the panel can enlighten uh, us on this. Sarah? So I, um, you're preaching to the choir here because um, we have thought a lot about why TB should be able to acquire multidrug resistance in the face. It's that simple question, and are big believers in the importance of population size, and that unless people kind of come to terms with the fact that given enough bacteria and a mutation rate, albeit a, a low mutation rate, but given enough bacteria, it doesn't matter if your regimen is all new or you know partially new, they're at some level going to be uh, drug-resistant organisms that's going, that are going to emerge. And so at some level, you can't fully protect a regimen. And, and we let people go on for a very long period of time, getting sicker and sicker with these enormous bacterial burdens, um, uh, and then don't consider the effect of bacterial burden and their likelihood of coming down with drug resistance or adding drug resistance to already pre-existing drug resistance. So, so uh, go ahead, Rob. Advocate early diagnosis so I am a strong believer that early I, in fact, my lab will laugh at me because <laughs> I think early in the lab, bacterial burden and early diagnostics are a much more important determinant of the subsequent ability to or subsequent emergence of drug resistance than, in fact, compliance is. So if you look at the studies where people do, you know, non-compliance in chemostat models, they have a really hard time of generating drug resistance. But bacterial burden, it's clear it's a linear relationship between bac bacterial burden and drug, the emergence of drug resistance. Just to get back to it, the main reason that patients are diagnosed late is not because of our diagnostic tools, which are getting much better, but it's actually because of stigma. They don't want to come in and get tested. So we need to do a lot of public education to get around that so we can, in fact, get them diagnosed sooner. <laughs> oh, actually, 
So the, the so I can rephrase the question. So the point is that even in the in the current status, 30% of people with tuberculosis are not diagnosed, and that's because, as Bob said, people have to go to a place to be diagnosed. And if you're worried about stigma, which seems to be a, a, a almost universal concern about TB, you don't want to go anywhere public where everybody's going to know you have either TB or HIV or whatever. Um, an alternative to that, and that what worked in the United States during World War II, before there was streptomycin even, was active case finding. Everybody had a chest x-ray on a regular basis. Kids were tested every year uh, for skin test conversion, and their families were treated. What's the feasibility in India or South Africa for active case finding? I don't think we have the means to um, manage our huge uh, existing uh, workload of patients really just now to do contact tracing, for example. So uh, I, I can see it bringing div dividends, but uh, I, I think presently, again, it's a, it's a luxury we can't afford. So I would argue I, I'm a great uh, critic of case finding. In the, in the best early epidemiological studies, fewer than 50% of cases in Czechoslovakia had any known contact with tuberculosis. I think it's a waste, a vast waste of resources. That's very different than mobile x-ray units, which now don't require silver for film, and are used essentially nowhere to go from village to village to say who's got TB, and that means there are contacts that have TB if you want to wall it off. Is that feasible? I think it's just the added cost again, really. It's the added cost. Yeah. yeah. I, I think and the patients to treat. You double the patients sure. to treat. But there, there, I'm sorry, there, there are simpler ways of doing active case finding than, than uh, x-rays. You can just ask people if they're coughing and, and then proceed. And we have the, Rob and I were talking about this earlier, we have the technology, you know, cell phones, uh, to easily survey people who are at high risk. Uh, there's, you know, there's lots of options here for both contact tracing because even though most patients aren't direct contacts of uh, TB patients, we see enormous burdens within households of, of cases. And these vulnerable groups like uh, malnourished kids or smokers or diabetics, and uh, most of them have cell phones. I want to pick up on the same theme with maybe an institutional uh, slant to it. Um, what happens in Tom's Siberia is that a patient will be diagnosed with good laboratory support, smear x-ray, and be admitted to the hospital, to the Tom's TB hospital, and they will be start put in a room which is pretty much sealed much of the year because of the cold. And they'll be put in a room with other patients who have been diagnosed, assumed to have drug, resist, uh, drug susceptible TB, because that's the majority of the cases and they'll be treated until they fail, and then they'll get drug susceptibility testing. Right. They've incubated with many other patients. It's no surprise that the biggest risk factor for MDRTB in Tomsk is being hospitalized for MDRTB. So what we're proposing all over the world, really, is a, 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 an approach to transmission that says active case finding of coffers at all entrance points. It could be a prison, it could be a hospital, it could be a clinic rapid testing for TB diagnosis, rapid drug susceptibility testing, and getting people quickly on effective therapy. Because ineffective therapy, those patients in Tomsk are on ineffective therapy, doesn't stop transmission. Effective therapy stops transmission almost immediately. So I think, you know, we could interrupt the, you know, was mentioned in Moldova prisons, they didn't look at hospitals, but this is not the only place the households are, as, as Megan mentioned, but it's a, it, they're, they're big breeding places for TB, and it's possible in those limited settings to, to do active case finding, diagnose early, and to treat effectively. So let Following me just... that fast, by the way, find, find cases actively, separate, and treat. So let me ask about hospitals and one of the objections to TDR-TB. Uh, terminology, and in fact, the, the, the one that I think is the one that worries me most. And, um, you have galvanized the world's attention in a fantastic way. Couldn't have been done any other way. Who's going to work in a TB hospital in South Africa or Moldova, which is full of MDR-TB patients? I would point out that before XDR was identified in Tugela Ferry, eight nurses died of 
tuberculosis. And that's a problem. Um, in Moldova, which I happen to know something about, that many of the doctors in the hospital are retired, TB hospital, are retired physicians trying to make a little money. Um, when they die off of TB or other <laughs> causes, uh, it is not clear, if Helen would correct me, but if it's not clear to someone who's been involved in that, that there's another generation of people who want to work in TB hospitals. Mm -hmm. And that's where this is a, a bit of a problem, and the stigma, not just for patients, but for healthcare workers, has to be addressed as well. Of course, Dr. Udwadia works in a TB hospital. I mean, he represents the cadre of people who, who and, make that choice. And, and just latently infected at last count, at least. <laughs> uh, but, but, but I've lost uh, count of the number of residents uh, who've worked with me who've come down with uh, TB of all forms, including MDR and XDR TB, of course. And you're right about how it's difficult to get, for example, surgeons who are prepared to operate on these patients yeah. as well. It was the old school which was happy to do so, but the combined uh, sort of cardiothoracic surgeons of these days are much happier doing a clean cabbage and uh, earning their money than laboring away and, and potentially infecting themselves and the OT staff. So it is a problem. Many private hospitals will not admit these patients. So. Uh, Perhaps, as Professor Nadal said, it's best to keep them out of hospital anyway, really, in terms of reducing their infectivity. But uh, it is a problem, just the manpower of, uh, uh, to, to look after these patients. So it's a th I think that's a political argument for those who've raised that question. Uh, if you don't keep these numbers of MDR and XDR and TDR cases down, you're not going to have a healthcare infrastructure that's going to deal with people with a cough. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to go back to the act of case finding and ask about if, um, so I think it's about a third of people with TB have HIV. And I would, my understanding, but I'm not a, a physician, is that you won't really see those cases on by chest x-ray, or you'll lose a majority of those by they chest They don't transmit for the most part. So if you don't have a chest problem, these are people who know more about it than I do. But my understanding is uh, extra pulmonary TB if you're concerned about the population risk for the disease, they're basically not major transmitters, but nor you, are children who don't cough. But you'd want to find them. Like, of course you want to find them. <laughs> right. I, I, I guess I was just wondering if, um, well, that, yeah, that's fine. Let me just comment. I, I do think that I mean, the concept of active case finding is an important one, and it is something that we would like to do. I think it probably is going to require a new generation of technology of point-of-care diagnostics to really be able to roll it out in communities without an extensive cost. I mean, many chest x-rays, you may not have to have film, but you still have to have somebody read the chest x-ray and get the result back to you, and it becomes a big deal. So I think the ability to do that is going to require a new technology. And, and I know people are working on things that may, may be possible. So that's, I think, the best hope for that. I actually had a question to follow up on uh, active case finding and what we can do as scientists to help uh, improve those technologies. And one thing that strikes me is that we're still missing some of the basic biology uh, in terms of, I think, what was mentioned earlier, of finding biomarkers. So is should we be investing some research dollars into a real concerted effort to find biomarkers so that we can create a dipstick test, for example? So let me Ken, ask the... Ken is here. Or, or how far away are we from a dipstick? Uh, Ken, do you care Ken, to comment? Ken, do you to comment? Um, so I'm actually sitting next to the program officer who runs the program. Um, <laughs> we funded 10 grants last year to look for biomarkers, but it's a big effort, you know, and that's, that's not a huge program, and a lot more effort needs to go into that. But I would completely agree that finding a point of care is the biggest diagnostic challenge because shortening that period between a patient, you know, spreading the disease around and getting onto treatment is something that we're really very well focused on. That would be a game changer. I think we, it doesn't solve the problem, but it, it would be a game changer if people could be put on treatment uh, without having to fail once or twice uh, over a period of two years. And, okay. I, and, and I would personally like biomarkers of cure versus relapse, so that you, if you had a biomarker that would tell you within two months or three months of treatment, or at, at the end of treatment or at the beginning of treatment, that this person is going to be cured for sure, and this person is going to fail, and then you can start playing around with the 
various combinations, I think that would be a win. Right now, you have to follow a patient for over a year to make sure that they're actually cured, at which point you may have lost not only as far as the disease is concerned, but also in the re resistance generation. I, I think the urinary lamb antigen is the closest we have to a dipstick sort of test, uh, at least in the HIV positive population, but it doesn't work very well. And we've been looking at uh, breath condensates really as a direct, uh, literally as the patient walks into your office with a chap called Michael Phillips in New York. Uh, and we've shown that it's not got great sensitivity or specificity, but perhaps... Uh, it's about 60%. That's right, that's yeah. right. So uh, one of the themes of uh, Scott Podolsky's talk was how differently drug resistance is handled in TB versus other bacterial infections, and, and I think that's true. It strikes me a, maybe a much more uh, stark contrast is how it's dealt with in antibacterial versus antiviral therapies. Um, and it strikes me that the HIV and HCV drug development communities over the last few years have done an amazing job of developing drugs that specifically elicit lower rates of resistance because they look like substrates or because they're flexible enough to deal with uh, uh, drug targets that are undergoing mutation. And I never hear about that in the TB drug development process. And I guess, A, Kesey is, do you hear about it? Is there a reason that we're not thinking this way um, and maybe uh, taking a page from the virologist book? So drug development specifically to beat resistance. Mm. Hey. So, <laughs> so we think about it a lot and we try a lot. But again, so, so, so resources again come to bear here because if today, when we decided the TV Alliance, which program to follow, for example, would we rather go and modify a fluoroquinolone so that we get a slightly better one or are we better off starting with a completely novel agent that's targeting that target that we like, but is completely uncompromised by resistance? So, so this is a choice now. We would love to do it. I would love, for example, to start a program that, that improves on rifamycin, one of the best class. We just, we, th there's not enough that we know to be able to start a program and be sure this is going to succeed. And everything that we start has to have a, a huge degree of success because we, we can't have any do-overs because we're not a large farm. It'd partic so, be particularly attractive for one of the new drugs um, to... Yeah, oh yeah, so as you, as you develop it, also be thinking about, yeah, so yeah, we, we think about it, it's, it's, it's difficult to do. So, so, so say for example, so most of the discovery right now is done entirely on, you just screen against whole bugs, you find things and then you go and find a target. If you find the target on time and you could right away figure out what the resistance mechanism was and you have a crystal structure and all those things, that's where we're, trying, we're headed towards. Uh, the Gates Foundation again is leading some of this. That's, that's where we'd like to go, it's just not very easy. Uh, one thing I think the uh, health minister could do is a relationship to education. Um, I'm old enough, so I remember uh, the um, mobile x-ray units. But more than that, when we went to school, starting in grammar school, we had units in science and health that talked about how to prevent the spread of TB never sharing somebody else's cup, never sharing a bite of your apple with somebody else. Um, so we were aware of this, and so were our parents. No Christmas card was ever mailed without a Christmas seal. The Christmas seal um, project was a public uh, profit, a nonprofit organization to raise awareness and money for TB. And the whole country was behind that. Uh, and so it was always in the back of our minds. And what you can do at this time in India is certainly bring up the younger generation to be more aware of this issue. And possibly you will raise up an advocacy group over a few years. Hi. 
Um, I agree uh, with her comments for the education and um, actually I uh, worked in India in a TB lab and now I'm working here in the US in a, in a supranational reference lab. So I am working with the developing countries right now in South America. Um, so it is right, like uh, I think my grandmother actually was diagnosed with TB and although I was a medical student and medical lab technology student, but we were still not aware of all these things that the TB spreads like this and then how the family should be protected and you should be aware of all the, these things. Um, so that is one important part. And also I think another important part is the early detection and diagnosis. Now working in developing countries, I can see because as a supranational lab that they are just struggling in the developing countries right now, even with microscopy. The labs I am going to, they have reagents for microscopy, which they bought 10 years ago, and they are still using those reagents to diagnose. So the labs, again, they have all the fancy equipment sitting there, but still the, for microscopy, they are using like 10 year old reagents. And we are trying to get them the reagents from last one year, even for microscopy. So I mean, so I think a drug susceptibility is like even, Further in countries like Haiti and in all these developing countries, uh, it's a, I mean for early diagnosis and detection. I think setting up the labs is is really important. At Got least it. for okay, drug, thank drug you. susceptibility. So setting up labs, developing new drugs are some very positive things that only take 15 years to get done. Um, I have to go back to the prime minister of uh, in India and. Um, Give him your best advice on what any prime minister in any country afflicted with uh, MDR, XDR, TB, RTB, what you think the priorities that they could do. And I'll start with Kissy, and I'll ask everybody to make one or two, but no more. Tell me where to put my money in the government. India has a policy. They spent... Um, two years ago, they spent 0.9% of GDP on health. It's one of the lowest in the world. They passed legislation that it would have to go to 3%. They're not there yet. So the money is not limiting in India at this point, believe it or not. So for me, in that situation, I guess I would say, for a third world country, I would say in the DST and surveillance, but for a developed country where we come in, where the rest of the world comes in, Let's all find ways of improving more knowledge on the disease, really deep knowledge on the basic biology of the disease so that we can get better drugs, not just for killing the bug, but for moderating the immune system and getting better treatments. Sarah? I'm going to take the Republican tack um, and say that... Um, You're not going to work on my floor anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that the, uh, the important and... Um, uh, things one could do now are essentially at the public-private interface and in creating a private sector that can deliver care well, deliver care efficiently, and, um, and use a little bit of the Kim Lewis uh, rationale that in fact the private sector needs to, the broader private sector, not just the medical private sector, but the broader private sector needs to understand that TB is an economic issue for the country and therefore those resources need to be to some extent mobilized for the disease um, and its control. Yeah, I'm going to still guilt the prime minister as, as reconfiguring this as, as a moral issue about that its poorest population are being most um, afflicted with, with this particular disease. Uh, and, and there is a moral com commitment. And while education is important, there are structural constraints against having people act out whatever they're being taught. And I think those need to be addressed as well. So how would you do that? Where would I put my money? Yeah, um, I mean, I would I'd be building. I don't know where these, where these children in the homes are during the day. Are they, are they in school? I'd be building schools. I would be having places for them to be outside the home to, to begin with. Mm -hmm. Bob? I, I would do two things. I'd, I'd start a, a, a public education campaign so that people who had TB or suspected they might have TB uh, knew that they could go someplace and, and get it cured and get it taken care of to kind of remove the stigma. The other thing I would do is, is 
look at the reason that there are disincentives for private practitioners to work with the public system and change those incentives. It may involve paying them for referring people, but they, you should do something to make sure that this system where the private practitioners try to keep their patients away from the public sector is reversed. I would say there's a complexity to that, and that is a significant percentage of the private sector is also paid by the public sector, and 50% of medical clinics in India and rural areas do not have a physician paid to be there. They're in private practice in the afternoon. So one of the solutions I had to put, I'll put my name on this question, raise the pay of physicians in the private, in the public sector and fix up the public sector so people will want to go there to get the best techniques and whatever and not uh, saline injections and uh, steroids. In South Africa, mainly, it's a public sector problem, not a private sector at all. In fact, it's all treated in the public sector. And I think that you're absolutely correct. I would say that we need to invest a lot more in training healthcare professionals, building that up. At the moment, in South Africa's context, um, the majority of registered nurses are, are practicing in the developed world, not in South Africa. There's a total disincentive for um, doctors to, to work in rural situations, um, and the, they're all wanting to work in the city, work in the private sector, make lots of money. So I fully agree with you. We need to incentivize healthcare uh, and make it, um, well, in South Africa, it's, it's particularly in the nursing profession, is seen as a, a lower level job. It's not seen as a, a really high level job. And um, you don't get a lot of people entering that. Plus, we had a, a situation in which we closed a lot of these training institutions, which has prevented uh, maintaining a, a large number of highly professional healthcare professionals. Dr. Udwadi. I think a portion, enough additional funds to treating the huge numbers of MDRTB patients already existing. Uh, 600,000 is the official WHO estimate, but uh, uh, that's just the public version, not the private sector version. Uh, so additional funds and make the quality of the DOTS Plus programs uh, so good that patients wouldn't need to seek uh, private care. Uh, uh, you know, it, th that's the best way to, uh, to do it, I would say. Um, no, I, I would do exactly what he said. I would try to strengthen the... Um, There's a big interest now in health systems, and the general view, as Don Berwick said, is uh, every system works perfectly as it was designed to work. If it is working inadequately, you've got to redesign the system. And fixing TB when every other infectious disease is not done, or as we've done in India uh, and other countries, we fix AIDS and don't. Uh, fix the infectious disease reporting surveillance when there's stockouts and drugs. Those are systems problems. And I'm not sure we know enough about, in the United States, our system, as you know, managed to survive on a hair string today in the Supreme Court. But we, we are not in a position to teach anybody how to have a perfect health care system. But fixing one disease at a time is not a way to fix a health system and to get people to go, particularly to the public sector. We're open for a couple more minutes for good ideas from the audience that I can take back. Good. Hi. Um, I know the pharmaceutical uh, drug makers probably sometimes um, don't deserve to have a seat at the table in a forum like this because not enough work is done in the pharmaceutical sector. But uh, uh, I'm in that sector and uh, representing programs that are, are very active in TB. And um, I think uh, the uh, allusions to the uh, HIV crisis uh, haven't been elaborated enough in the sense that the pharmaceutical industry uh, response was very important to conquering that situation. And uh, there are lots of uh, metaphors that can be used, but it was like, in many of the more serious uh, efforts, it was like a Manhattan Project mentality. There were, for whatever reasons, economic, emotional, or, or whatever, 
there was a major uh, movement within the pharmaceutical industry that not only looked for new drugs, even when the e economic margins were uh, perceived to be rather narrow, but they were looking for new drug regimens very quickly. I'm delighted to hear in all of the talk that the emphasis is moving from adding new drugs incrementally to new drug regimens, um, which is ultimately uh, what we need to do as an industry. But my advice then, Barry, would be perhaps to say to the government, don't forget the industry role and how you can maximise incentives. Now, in the transitional economy countries with the major population burdens of TB, there are alternative economic models for developing the rather rudimentary abilities of the innovation sector within the pharmaceutical industries. That represents an, uh, a great opportunity that intersects with the needs of TB research and then intersects with a third opportunity, which is the other piece of advice you might take to the government, and that is whatever they can do to lean on the policy of new... Um, guidelines for the acceptance of not just new drugs, but new drug regimens in uh, the registration process. As you well know, um, the uh, comparisons, uh, often on uh, ethical terms, is one of the big hang-ups with getting innovative, aggressive new drugs uh, in any field uh, to the population. But with the need of some of these uh, large disease burden uh, populations like India, the opportunity is immense to truly try some extremely innovative approaches, if the will is there, to revolutionising um, the, the approach to new drug registration criteria, and that will spill over into benefit in uh, all sorts of other populations as well. Right. So those would be my two pieces of advice. Right, and when Sarah says public-private partnerships, we include pharma in the private sector part of those partnerships, for sure. Other suggestions? Yeah. yeah. That, that broke at 10.30, Kim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it hangs on. Yeah, I, I have a it, something uh, It hangs to on say. For, for a bit, but it's yeah. not the best model for the rest of the world, I think. So uh, I think before, it, it sounds like a, a kind of catch-22. I, I think the system need a lot of work to fix, but uh, I think uh, before the f system fix, I think we still have a lot of things uh, we can do. One is rapid di diagnosis, cheap and rapid, uh, and something like a, a pre pregnant test, you know, like, you know, the really quick test. I think that's the key to determine the, uh, you know, the, the disease. Uh, second thing I think is important, I agree with her, uh, which is uh, a lot of things you can do, even with very limited resources, you cannot wait for people getting rich and then kill the TB. But now, it still have a lot of things to do, like lifestyle, the uh, hygiene, the uh, change the habit, uh, change error, uh, go in under the sun, take vitamin D, do exercise, uh, have those kind of uh, guidelines written in textbook, you know, in the elementary textbook. So everyone will know, just like she said when she got this, I think the uh, people even here do not get the TB because it's long history and uh, really effort, and the, yeah, okay. decades of so effort, we, we, those are positive, uh, right. positive experiences. Positive events that can be done to everybody yeah. uh, without fancy equipment if you educate them and provide information. We've come to the end of our time. and. It